Hello again. I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you about neurocognitive disorders. Um, I've got it here. Okay. Let me move this so that you can see what I'm looking at. So there are three main neurocognitive disorders. You have delirium, major neurocognitive disorder, and mild neurocognitive disorder. Um, and it's, it's difficult because there's overlap between all three of these. So delirium, first and foremost, doesn't have to be isolated to the elderly. I included a video um, that it's actually for medical providers to help them identify this in elderly and those individuals that are really sick. Um, but essentially, it's confused thinking and reduced awareness of surroundings um, the disturbance of consciousness and altered cognition develops over a short period of time. Um, there are several subtypes of delirium. You've got substance intoxication, substance withdrawal. So for those of you that would be working in addiction treatment facilities, this is something you'd have to watch out for. You can have medication induced. Um, you can have it due to a general medication, or there can be multiple etiologies that lead to delirium. Major neurocognitive disorder has a serious impairment and at least one of those following items, complex attention, executive functioning, learning and memory, language, perceptual motor, and social cognition. This disrupts their daily activities and does not manifest solely in delirium. Um, this would be common in individuals who have like, um, Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal degeneration, Lewy body disease, uh, vascular disease, traumatic brain injuries. It could be due to substance or medication use, um, HIV infection, prion disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, other medical conditions, multiple etiologies, or there could be an unspecified cause. Uh, typically, they would be able to figure out over time what the specified cause is. Um, in major neurocognitive disorder, um, they're going to have um, essentially a cognitive decline. It doesn't have to be that it continues. So like in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, it would be a progression. So let's say in the beginning, it's um, learning and memory. Uh, over time, you're likely going to start to see dysfunction then in general executive function and then complex attention and then language. Uh, social cognition, and then perceptual motor. Um, mild neurocognitive disorder is just a milder virgin, uh, version of major neurocognitive disorder. This is a moderate decrease in at least one of the cognitive functions that are noted for major neurocognitive disorder, um, but it doesn't seem to disrupt the daily activity performance. Um, and and what you would likely see is, say, a person with a neurodegenerative disease, they would start with mild neurocognitive disorder and then shift to major neurocognitive disorder. But if you have an individual who um, has chronic substance abuse, um, you can see these types of issues emerge as well um, because of the damage that's done to the brain. Specifically, we know that the longer that... Um, drugs are used and it doesn't seem to really matter what kind of drug, um, but think about um, um, recreational substances, right? Things that individuals would seek treatment for because of addiction issues. Um, literally, we can see over time holes, these, these dark spots that emerge in the brain where there's literally just degeneration of gray matter. Um, so it's important to be aware of these. Generally, uh, they're not things that you would treat, um, but they are things that you would be mindful of. Why would you need to care about delirium, um, MND, or uh, like major neurocognitive disorder or mild neurocognitive disorder? Um, because as a clinician, if you're working in the mental health field, you need, you're constantly relying on um, your client's ability to have accurate awareness of their surroundings and their experiences in order to report to you, right? 
So when you're using, for example, uh, mental health measures, you have to trust that they understand uh, the questions and the answers that they're able to recall and interpret their experiences accurately. And if there's evidence of delirium, major neurocognitive disorder or mild neurocognitive disorder, you would have to result to an approach um, that we call triangulation. And triangulation is where you are trying to collect some information from the client themselves, but you're also trying to collect um, the same information from a third party person who spends time with that individual. This is most commonly practiced in um, practicing with children, right? So you would get information from the parent, you would get information from the teacher, you might even get information from if there's like um, a TA or you know, a phys ed teacher or an arts teacher, you, you would try to get different people's perspective of their experience with the individual and you would ask them to answer the same questions because what you're looking for is consistency across these individuals. Okay, so if you suspect that or you are aware that your client has one of these three issues, then you need to triangulate your data collection you need to be collecting information from at least one third party person who spends a lot of time with this individual. Um, in good practice, you would collect it from more than one. Um, you would be mindful that there's a lot of subjectivity in the interpretation of what we observe in other people, behavioral observation. Um, there's a lot that goes into that in terms of our own experience, our own thoughts about self, our own beliefs about the client. And so in order to make sure that you're getting accurate information, it would be wise to collect from more than just one third party person who spends a great deal of time with the client. So that's why you would need to be mindful of these. Also, being aware of these allows you, if at any time you suspect that this is an issue with your client and they're not currently receiving psychiatric services or other medical services, you could do a referral. Um, and if, um, like in delirium, they need to be treated immediately. So that, that would be a call to the hospital. Um, but in terms of uh, the other issues, you could bring it up a treatment team and ask the psychiatrist to evaluate them. Um, and um, that's what you would do if they are receiving some type of psychiatric care. Um, if you work at say um, an integrated facility where they have um, behavioral and physical health that are treated in the same agency, you could share information, information interdepartmentally um, to make sure that a medical provider is aware of this and can do further examination. Um, these issues are rooted in biology. Okay, so we can't change thoughts and feelings uh, to fix this. Um, it's, it's definitely going to need further examination to figure out if this is going to be progressive, what's causing the problem, um, and, and do, do we need to do something medically to create change, or is this part of a natural progression of a disease that they already have? Okay, um, but it is noted in the DSM. You want to be aware of these, especially if you are working with anyone in substance treatment. Um, if you're working with um, anyone who has a um, chronic history of severe mental illness or who might be struggling with a chronic health condition, um, it, like specifically delirium is more common in individuals who are very sick. Um, and so it's important. It's important that we're just mindful of these. Um, okay. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you for listening. And um, I'll see you in the next lecture.